from rags to R1, bridging internal divides through higher education. So who is Shan Colley? I'm a friend, a student, a published author, a poet, a daughter, and a cat mom. <laughs> These pictures essentially sum up my life. The snapshots that you see on the PowerPoint behind me are everything that I love and care about. So what do these pictures fail to tell you? What these pictures fail to tell you is that I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and the daughter of an alcoholic from a low income household. That I am a first generation college student braving the front of higher education with a unique perspective. That I suffer from PTSD, depression, anxiety, and borderline personality disorder. That I tried to take my life every year onward from my sophomore year of high school into the beginning of my college career. My childhood was one that was different from many of the other children surrounding me. Growing up in the small mill town of Weirton, West Virginia, I had no idea what the world could look like until I got to WVU. I was consumed by my immediate environment. The life I led was setback, plagued by constant setback. My father's alcoholism consistently dampened my childhood. We were unable to go on vacations, have family dinners, or hold holidays because of my father's addiction. These events were consistent within my life from the time that I was born until I moved out for college. Due to my father's inability to stay sober and my mother constantly working to support our family, I was then taken care of by a next door neighbor. This next door neighbor then groomed me and assaulted me from the time that I was in elementary school until middle school. This abuse stopped around the time that I began the eighth grade. I had stopped going over to the neighbor's house and they had stopped coming over to ours. I had no idea what had happened to me. All I knew was that I was terrified and that I didn't want to be there anymore. Within the same year, my father's alcoholism only got worse. It got so bad that I would frequently journal to my English teacher, Miss Letiri, about these incidences. I remember for an assignment in class one day, we were to write about a family member for a peer to review. I had never written anything about my father for another student to read. So on that day in eighth grade, I penned down my autobiography into a Walmart composition notebook. I wrote about how my father and I would play plush football in the hallway, how we would throw the ball back and forth endlessly, how he would throw it into my chest and how it hurt, but I didn't mind because I was just a kid who was having fun with their dad. I wrote about how this tradition slowly ended with the increase of my father's addiction, how he became more and more immobile by the day, and how plush football in the hallway one day disappeared forever. Because of this, I was completely unable to go on. My mental illnesses began to arise. I began to cut myself with serrated kitchen knives and in the same hand began to behave terribly in school. I lost the respect of my friends and my teachers because I was so hateful. I would call people names, start fights 
with those closest to me and make highly inappropriate comments during class in order to get my peers' attention. The trauma that I had experienced had completely changed me as a person. I was totally and absolutely foreign to who I once was. I needed help. And I finally got that help my sophomore year of high school. In 2014, I was admitted into an adolescent mental health facility for suicide attempt number one. Well, by staying for a week, I only got worse emotionally. This attempt was triggered by becoming sexually active with a boyfriend during this time in my life. This event became a catalyst for me to remember bits and pieces of the abuse that I had repressed. The person whom I thought I loved the most, the person whom I thought I loved more than my own father, the person whom I called grandpa, who took me to his family reunions in his daughter's house, had taken advantage of me. With the weight of the world on my teenage shoulders, I trudged on the absolute best that I could. Things only got worse, and my suicide attempt showed the progress that I failed to make. Although I tried to have fun for the sake of the memory, I was completely unable to enjoy myself during homecomings, proms, or football game Fridays because I felt that there was no point in my existence. I felt as if I had no power or no say in my own life. So what else do these pictures fail to tell you? What these pictures also do not tell you is that I am resilient. I am strong beyond my circumstances and better because of them. These pictures only disclose a particle of my identity as opposed to the rest of my composition. I knew nothing other than these tribulations until I came to West Virginia University. This is when everything changed. So what did higher education do to transform my tribulations? Coming to WVU changed my life in that it granted me my independence. My dependence on other people who consistently failed to assist me was what ultimately led to my high school downfall. Entering Morgantown on a sunny summer day in August 2016, I knew this had changed. The world was at my fingertips. I could do whatever I wanted, whether it be eat or study or go hang out with friends, free from fear and terror. There would be no one for me to be scared of anymore whether it be the menace next door or my own father. My responsibility towards myself is what has allowed me to flourish. Because of the amazing experiences that I've had within WVU's English department, I plan on pursuing a master's degree in literature and cultural studies and then afterwards pursuing a PhD. This is because of the amazing personal relationships that I have been able to form with each and every English professor that I have had. These professors, each with heavy loads of graduate coursework and adult responsibilities, found time in their schedules to give me a chance. For a school of over 30,000 students, this is an incredible aspect for a university faculty to care this much. I remember the fall semester of my sophomore year, my English professor, Dr. Claycomb, asked us to send him a poem that we had written for an assignment. I sent him one that I'd written my senior year of high school, and I went back too often because it was one of my stronger works. Dr. Claycomb emailed me the next day, asking if I was okay, because the poem spoke on behalf of the suicidal ideations that I had in high school. Dr. Claycomb is not only a professor, but an advisor as well. 
He has a wife, a family, and a career that requires much of him. Despite all of this, this person saw that I was struggling and decided to reach out. This is what makes WVU so special. Regardless of where a mountaineer comes from or where they are going, it is simply tradition to be a friend in Morgantown. The simplicity of this kindness is what has saved me. So what becomes of us when we are given this chance? The person that I have become is because of the person that I have been. I genuinely, truly, and earnestly do not believe that I would have been able to accomplish as much as I have without the help of my peers, instructors, and administration here at WVU. I came into this institution lost, broken, and hungry, and will come out of it as the woman I have always dreamed of being. I wouldn't be here standing in front of you today if I were not a mountaineer. I want those of you who come from non-traditional backgrounds, who had free lunch growing up, who had to shop at Goodwill, who had to watch your mother struggle, who had to worry about merely surviving when you should have just been able to be a child to understand that this world is yours before it is anyone else's. We have had our tribulations. We have fought them and conquered them more times than any hand can count. We are strong because of where we come from and not weak like the world may make us seem. It is difficult to succeed in a world that always seems to be plotting against you. It is even more difficult when this chase for success leads to failure after failure. Although these mistakes are unnerving, frustrating, and oftentimes unfair, they are there. These cards that we have been dealt, whether by fate or celestial body alone, are ours for the taking. They are ours to understand, to manipulate, and to eventually break. In order to beat life's heroin conventions, we must first familiarize ourselves with every possibility and move forward from where we are most able to. The starting point may not be as close to the finish line as other people's, but this is why our practice makes us perfect. To know struggle, especially one unique to us, is the strife of life. It keeps us going. It gives us purpose where purpose has failed to provide. It grants us grit and it gives us the opportunity to show the world that lies underneath what pictures fail to tell us. Thank you.